If you have your Bibles, would you please take it and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 26 through 39. Luke writes, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, back in April of 22, I was serving a church in Kentucky, and we had a lady who belonged to our church come in, and she just had to share with me some of the most exciting news she had heard. Some of the things that she had experienced was unlike anything else she had ever seen. She had been traveling, and she went through Richmond, Kentucky. And in Richmond, Kentucky, she said, there was this most amazing gas station where it had pumps and pumps and pumps of gas. And then she went inside, and she said it was unbelievable. The restrooms were clean. And she said, Barry, you won't believe it. They were actually selling brisket in this gas station. Oh, and she was like, oh, it was so amazing. You were shopping. It was everything you want. It was so neat. And she said there was this big beaver on the sign, and it was a Bucky's. <laughs> she was, and she was like, wow, it's so amazing. We can't wait to go back. Word got around that there was this new gas station in Richmond, and everybody was talking about it. People were traveling. It was three hours away from where we lived. People in our church were putting groups together to travel to Bucky's to go see this gas station. People could not get enough of it. Everybody was talking about it. It was the biggest thing since sliced bread, just to go to Bucky's. Now we later learn that Bucky's is a Texas thing. Yeah. Now here's the most amazing thing about this, is that I moved to Texas last fall. The Mecca of Bucky's. When I lived in Kentucky, people invited me to Bucky's all the time. Do you want to go on a road trip? Since I've moved to Texas, not one person has invited me to Bucky's. <laughs> not one person has told me about Bucky's. Now I'm wondering why is that? My guess is that Bucky's is such a thing here that everybody says, everybody knows about Bucky's. You know it's there. If you want to go, you just go. Or perhaps it's that they're afraid that I may ask a question about Bucky's that they don't know the answer to. Or maybe they don't want to offend me. Maybe they say he might be a 7-Eleven kind of guy. And so I don't want to offend him by telling him about Bucky's. 
I joke about that, but I say this because one of the blessings and curses about living in a place like we live is there is a church on every corner. And we automatically assume everybody already knows the good news of Jesus Christ. Everybody already knows they need to go to church. Well, just look, there's a church there. They'll just walk in the door and go. I don't need to tell them. I don't need to say anything. But y'all, people need to hear the good news. There's a world out there that is hurting. And we have the greatest news the world has ever heard. We've been talking about our new purpose statement. And that is to be... Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, let's try this again. To be in leading, to be, okay, that's great. We're going out there and doing this. And we said that there are five foundational truths that we're having. So God's word is our authority. We looked at how we don't look at what the world says. We says, what does the Bible say? Prayer is our priority. So everything we do is bathed in prayer. Worship is our response. It's not a show. It's not a performance. It is a heart rejoicing because of what God has done for us. We just scream and shout because of who he is. But today we're going to look at evangelism and discipleship, how that is our focus. We are called, go and make disciples of all nations. Go tell the world about Jesus Christ. Now that is not a burdensome command. It's not like, oh, we got to go do this. Because when you receive good news, you just can't wait to tell people about it. I told the first service this, this past weekend, I had to take my daughter and my wife to a thing called Scarefest in Irving. And, and it, was, it was terrible. But they got to meet folks. And my wife was so excited. She got to meet D. Wallace. Now, if y'all don't know who Dee Wallace is, because I didn't know, but Dee Wallace is the mother from E.T., and she starred in one of my wife's favorite films, Cujo. I don't know what that says about my wife, but... <laughs> but she got to meet her, and they hugged, and they talked, and they, they talked for a while. It was amazing, and, and they became like good friends. And so afterwards, my wife immediately had to tell everybody... She got on her social media and says, I just talked with Dee Wallace. And she was so excited about everything. She didn't have, I didn't have to go, hey, you need to tell everybody that you just met Dee Wallace. Because she was so overjoyed. She just couldn't help but tell the world. If we're like that with Dee Wallace, how about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? I mean, think about how good news that we have, that we get to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. And the gospel meets our greatest needs, our needs for purpose, meaning, hope, love, forgiveness, and truth. We can proclaim Jesus as Lord. And it's not just something we share, we experience it. We get to experience all that, and then we get to share what we've already experienced. And Jesus tells us to, Acts 1.8, I love this verse. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Notice he says, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So Jesus sends us, but first he says, not only will I equip you with this power, but I will go with you. The Holy Spirit will be in you. And he will go with you, and then you will be my witness. See, I think a lot of times when we start talking about evangelism, people get kind of iffy about it because, A, we've all experienced bad things with it. How many times have you had to talk religion with someone, and you were like, ugh. You know, I'm a pastor. I get paid to talk about Jesus. <laughs> But there are some folks who are just like, they start talking about you. I'm like, you need to be nicer. <laughs> and we've had bad experience with it. But I think a lot of it comes with our hesitation of sharing our faith is because we are confused about our role. Jesus did not say, you will receive power and you will go and be my lawyers. We don't have to go and defend the gospel. Now, we've got to have a reason for the hope that is in us. But we don't have to know the answer to every question. 
I know one of the biggest things that worries people is if I start talking about Jesus, what if they ask a question that I don't know? I shared this before, I don't, can't tell you how many times I've been asked. What about Cain's wife? Where does she come from? And you say, well, that's a great question. Let me do some research. I'll get back to you. We'll go ask the pastor. But let me tell you about Jesus. He also did not say, you will go and be my judges in the world. Meaning it's not our job to go and to point our fingers and say, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. You're definitely out. (laughs) No, it's our job to go and be witnesses. And you know the only two qualifications for a witness? You have a personal experience and you're willing to share it with others. That's all it takes. You will be my witnesses. And so we say, come and see. Come and experience. Now think about how great this is. God, God, God can do all this without us. If God wanted right now to tell the world about it, he could just put a big thing in the sky and say, this is my son. But no, God decides to partner with us, to use us in our frailty and our mistakes and everything. And says, I will share the good news through you. And we get to be the one to do that. Now, something we learned from this text that we just read this morning is that everybody needs to hear the good news and every believer needs to share the good news. Every believer needs to hear the good news. Every believer needs to share the good news. Now think about this. I love this. In the early church, they did not have an evangelism initiative. They they did not have to say, everybody sit down. I'm going to tell you about your need to go out there and tell the world about Jesus Christ. They did not have a class on it. It was because they were so in love with Jesus Christ, they were so grateful for it, that they didn't have to be told. They just kind of did it. They were so excited, they just kind of shared it. Because they knew that people needed to hear what they had received. Now, we often talk about the Ethiopian eunuch, and we kind of focus on the negative. We say, oh, he was an Ethiopian eunuch, meaning he he wasn't be welcomed inside the... um, temple. He was a eunuch. He, he had bad things happen to him. And so when he went to the temple, he would not be welcomed there. Now that, that was all true. But we forget the good things about this eunuch. He was a powerful man. I mean, it says that he was the chief financial officer basically of Ethiopia. And we know he was very wealthy because A, he was riding in a chariot. Y'all, most folks didn't have chariots in that day. Chariots was a Tesla of that day. And he was writing in it, and he had a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Most folks didn't have scrolls. You might have to travel to the next town over to be able to read a scroll. And then third, he was able to read the scroll, which most folks couldn't read. He had all of this, but y'all, he was still hungry inside. He wanted to experience God. And I don't care how rich you are or how poor you are. We all have that in common. We all need Jesus. My wife, when uh, we first got married, we had to send notes back and forth to to each other. And oftentimes her notes would include a a mini sermon to me. (laughs) And one of her notes she sent was, she said, in every person's heart is a hole. And people try to fill it with things of this world, but it never satisfies The only thing that will ever fill that hole is Jesus Christ. Everyone needs to hear the good news. People need the Lord. God loves them. God pursues them. And because God loves them, his body, the church, needs to love them. And we need to go forth and tell the world about them. But who will go? We will. Now, the thing I love about this text is it sends Philip and you're thinking, who's Philip? Well, I'll tell you who Philip is not. Philip is not a preacher. Philip is not a pastor. Philip is not a scholar. Philip is not a bishop. Philip was ordained in Acts chapter 6 basically to serve tables. If you don't know what his job is, he was to take care of the widows. His job was to be the one in charge of Meals on Wheels. That was his duty. 
But yet God is going to use him to start a revival in Samaria, and God is going to use him to change this man's life forever. Not just his life here on earth, but his life for all eternity. And who is Philip? Philip is a nobody. But he got to tell about somebody. And that was the beauty of this. It wasn't about Philip. It's about the gospel. And so here's the great thing. So let's go back to our text. And first one you see here is evangelism is a divine partnership. God is going to set all this in motion, but he just needs us to listen and to obey. And so here's what happens. Philip is basically going to become, and y'all forgive me for saying this, but Philip is God's wingman. Okay? So God's going to get everything ready. Philip's going to go in there and get it all going. And so the first thing is that he needs to be sensitive to the Spirit's lead. Look at verse 26 of your text again. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now notice that God has placed all these key pieces in place. But Philip had to be listening, be receptive. He said, go, sit next to that chariot, stand next to that chariot. Now, Now God did not tell Philip every part of the plan. He did not explain to him, okay, Philip, you're going to go, you're going to speak to this guy, and don't be shocked, he's a eunuch, but don't be worried about that because I'm going to open his heart. No, he just said, go and stand and be ready. And so the Spirit was nudging Philip to go in this direction, and he had to listen and obey. And so here's the thing I I wanted us to know about is, what is our nudge? Where is the Spirit nudging you? Who is the Spirit nudging you to go tell? Is there someone in your heart, in your mind, that you've been thinking, God, I just, you've been wanting me to talk to that person, but I'm so terrified. Or where's God sending you to go? Where's God sending us as a church to go? Are we listening? Are we ready to go and do what he says? And so he goes, and he, he goes, and, and I tell you, this is so amazing. Philip obeys the Lord, and when he gets there, God has set everything up perfectly for him. Look at verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. A couple things here. First of all, God has already done all of the work. Y'all, the passage he is reading is Isaiah 53. That is like a fastball over home plate right in the middle, just set up perfectly for a home run. I mean, you could not have a better text to say, oh yeah, but you want to know who that is? Let me tell you what that's talking about. And what you will find is you go to talk to someone about Jesus Christ, you will find that God has already been there the whole time. God has plowed the field, got it all set. He's just waiting for you to drop that seed in there. He's waiting on you. And Philip went there. And one of the things I love about this passage is how respectful Philip was. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Have you all ever had someone come up to you and try to berate you about your beliefs? Try to tell you how dumb you are for believing what you believe? try to mock you and just laugh at you? Did you like it? No. Don't do it to other folks. Be respectful. I I love how Philip does this. First of all, you notice he wasn't deceitful. He didn't get up there and promise this eunuch things that weren't true. He didn't say, hey, listen, if you want to know about Jesus, he will make your life so perfect, you'll never have any problems whatsoever. Your life will be great. You'll be healthy, wealthy, have gold, as you can believe. It'll be amazing. Just do it now. He wasn't condescending either. He didn't say, what are you reading? Isaiah? My goodness, you don't know the difference between Isaiah and Jeremiah. Here, let me tell you what that really means. He also wasn't abrasive. He didn't go up there and say, hey, look, there's a survey that says there's 24 reasons why people are going to hell, and I want to know, why are you going? No. 
He got up and he heard what he was doing and he asked this simple question. Do you understand what you are reading? Think about how simple that is. Do you understand that? And the guy says, how can I? How can I unless someone explains it to me? And the door was open. And notice that it says here, he invites him in to the chariot. Philip did not charge his way in there and force himself and says, let me tell you about this. He earned the right to speak to someone about Jesus Christ. One of the things I think is important, it says he sit. That's a relationship. And one of the best things you do to make the faith attractive is you go out there and you be Christ-like to this world. And you earn that right to share the good news with others. And so he shared the good news. And it says that he started with where he was, but then he ended up with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Notice it didn't say he started that passage of Scripture then shared his opinions on politics. He didn't start with that very passage and share him the niche theology that he wanted to point out. No, it says he started that very passage and he ended up with the good news of Jesus Christ. And let me emphasize that, the good news. Let's not forget, this is good news. The gospel is good news. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's good news. And that's what we share. We share this good news. And the man responded in verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? He didn't force him. He didn't coerce him. He didn't manipulate him. The man said, you know, I've, I've thought about this, and I want this Jesus that you have. Why can't I be baptized? And Philip said, hey, let's do it. And it's a beautiful scene. So what's this mean for us? First, we must live the gospel in order to share the gospel. We must live the gospel in order to share the gospel. You can't give something that you haven't received yourself. You need to have it in your heart so that you can give it. And so here, when we share the gospel, we are sharing what God has done in our life. We have experienced it, and we want to share it with others. Meaning, this is not a sales pitch. You're not going out trying to, to profit off the gospel or trying to just put people in the pews. You're going out there because of what God has done in your life. And you're so excited about it, you just can't help but share it. That's why I say the first thing of our mission, to be Christ-like. I want us to have Christ in our hearts so we can go and share that with others. And we can share that wonder and that joy. And second of all, we must live and tell the gospel to the hurting world. Tell it with our mouths. Have you ever heard the, the quote from St. Francis of Assisi? Which I just think is a funny name. But he said, uh, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. That sounds great, but A, there's no evidence that he ever actually said that. And B, it presumes your life is so good that people are going to be like, wow, look how great you are. I mean, I, I'm trying to imagine a scene if Philip did evangelism like we did, he'd run by the, the chariot and just stand there and like, is he looking at me? Yeah, I'm good, ain't I? Does that make sense? No, now, now we're supposed to make our faith attractive, but we need to tell people about Jesus Christ. And plus, it puts the initiative on them instead of on us. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go out there and invite, come and see. He did not say, sit and wait. That's not a command of God, sit and wait for people to show up. He said, you go and you share the good news. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, talk about your faith in a natural way. Sometimes when we start talking about religion, we automatically get uptight. 
or we break out in King James, or we start to get the holier-than-thou attitude. No. If I'm going to tell you about my wife, I'm going to tell you, hey, this is my, 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 my beautiful bride. She's, we, got, we met when I was 19 years old, and she was the pastor's daughter. Oh, he scared me to death. And, and I go on, I talk about how we met. I'll tell you what the difference she's made in my life. And I'll tell you, hey, do you, she's, she's over here. Do, do, you, do you want to meet her? I don't say, thou are wicked, but my wife is holy, holier than thou. <laughs> No, speak naturally. And then also ask questions and be sincere in your desire to listen. How many of y'all remember doing the Romans Road of Salvation or the four spiritual laws? Okay, we were trained in those things. Here's the problem with that, and I agree they're all great things, but oftentimes we came with a prepackaged sermon ready to go, and we'll say, Hey, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. we'll just dive right into it. People don't want to be lectured to, they want to be listened to. And so ask them, how is it with your soul? Yeah, that, that tragedy that happened, that was terrible. What do you think about that? That's a good question. Let's talk about that. Let me tell you about the difference that Jesus made in my life. You listen and you talk and you respect. And third, simply invite them to come and see. Remember, you are a witness. Come and see. And it's not that hard. Hey, why don't you come to church with me? Well, that's a good question. I'll tell you what, why, why don't we read the Bible together? You and I can just pick a chapter of the Bible, we'll read it together. Or there's this good book that I've read that really helped me. Why don't we just do it together? Come and see. Come and see. You see, we have a message to tell the world, and it's good news. I'll close with this, one of my favorite stories. In 2 Kings chapter 7, there is this story about where the, the Arameans have basically besieged Jerusalem, and there's a, a siege going on, and people are starving, and they're, they're hurting. And outside the walls, there are these lepers. And the lepers are the outcasts of society. They're not welcome inside the gates, and they're being pushed out. And they're hungry too, and they're starving. And so finally they get to the point where they're at the brink of death, and they say, why don't we just go turn ourselves in to this army, and maybe they'll give us something, but we just can't sit here and die. Now what the lepers did not know is that in the middle of the night, God has sent his angel down to the camp, and the army turned on itself, got scared, killed each other, and then ran off. And they left everything, all the food, all the money, all the good stuff. They abandoned everything. It was right there. And so lepers go to turn themselves in, and then they see all these turkey legs and roast beef and pizza and all that good stuff. And they start eating, and they're having this feast. But then they look at each other. And in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9, I love this. Then they said to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. We got such good news that the world needs to hear. We can't keep it to ourselves. Let's go tell everybody. Y'all, the world is hurting. The world's a mess. And you know what they need? They need what you got. They need Jesus Christ. But who will go? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Send me.